look what you see is only the little part of we there is a big world around in which you can design you can create new markets as well because market if it is sustainable why not if there are new products that are sustainable and good for us and the planet why not let's do it the issue is when you design unsustainable systems you design unsustainable products and you preserve unsustainable environment this is the problem but then if we all work for a purpose this would be perfect <laughs> Dr. Sonia Masari is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Dr. Sonia Masari has 20 plus years of experience as a researcher, lecturer, consultant, and designer in the fields of education, sustainable food design, innovation in the agri-food sector. She holds a PhD on food experience design at the Engineering Department, University of Florence, Italy, with a thesis that combined the importance of education, the food system, and digital technologies. Her research started by noting that daily social practices of production, distribution, and consumption of food are radically altered by digital technology networks. She continues her research to critically and empirically evaluate the evolution and role played by digital technologies and the cultural transmission and innovation of food practices. For 12 years, she was an academic director of the University of Illinois Urbana Campaign Food Studies programs in Rome, and she designed and coordinated more than 50 academic programs and 150 initiatives on food and sustainability for prestigious international institutions. She has been in this space for many, many years and has worked with many super universities. She currently teaches at several universities uh, around Italy. She also has some new wonderful things coming up and uh, things in the pipeline that we will talk about today, really, which is super exciting. And that's the main reason why we're here today is she just published her book, um, Transdisciplinary Case Studies on Design and Food and Sustainability. Do you have a copy there to hold up for us, Sonia? Oh, so beautiful. I only have the digital version, so I'm not so lucky to get a print copy, but uh, I'll have to get one real soon. Um, and that's really why we're here to talk about that and, and some of the new things that Sonia is working on, which is quite numerous. Um, she takes a very systemic approach to life and, and knows that in order to solve our global grand cha challenges and uh, complex food systems that we really need to take a systemic approach instead of a siloed linear approach where we get these specialist uh, glasses or these blinders on that, that put us into a narrow focus. Sonia, welcome to the podcast. It's so great to have you. Thank you so much for this invitation. I'm happy to be here. And I'm happy to say that one of the contributions at the beginning of the book is uh, from you. So <laughs> this is also an interesting connection. And actually, this is what I really wanted as part of the dialogue on uh, on the way how we need to see the food from a different perspective, different perspectives. Yeah, and I, I thank you for that. That was a sheer honor to be able to contribute and, and able to uh, write the prologue or one of the prologues of, of this wonderful book. It is a compilation and in five separate parts that is a wonderful journey and wonderful case studies. And we're going to get into that and talk about it a little bit further in more detail. But I, I kind of want to let our less listeners know that our paths have crossed over the years a, a few times. Uh, we know each other from the Future Food Institute and the Academy area from the the Rome Business School and from the Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition and their ninth international 
uh, form on food and nutrition from the BCFN. Um, and, and maybe many others may possibly Seijin Chips and, and the, uh, the, the World Expo that was in Milan and, and many other things that you've done and where you've spoken and also been with your academic works over the years. Um, and, and I've been very fortunate to see your evolution and your journey and, and uh, take part in, in seeing all the great works that you've done before. I, with all that in mind and kind of with your bio as well, I, I want to ask you a question. We've just been through 15, 18 months of horror, of craziness. Our world has experienced COVID, the pandemic, mutations. Now we're looking at the Delta and whatever else. Black Lives Matter, Asian racism, uh, huge, horrific things happening in Italy as far as pandemic and how greatly that affected her there, um, as well as the inauguration of the United States and many, many other things. And I want to know those operating manuals, those academic learnings that you've had, the preaching or the educating you've been doing over all these years, one, have they proven to be a better model for life, a better model for food to help you weather this craziness and the storm a little bit better? And secondly, how have you been? I want an update. How, how did you get through all this crazy time and, and your work, your beliefs around sustainability, food systems, design and all that? How has that helped or maybe hasn't it helped to, to get through this? And have you seen the awareness rise up and change during this whole time? Thank you. Thank you for, uh, first of all, for many things you said about my, my background. And uh, you're right. Uh, I'm actually, uh, in a way, designing my own professional uh, career by connecting dots. So for me, this is really important to connect all the experience and also the people I met and the organization I was uh, uh, honored and able to work with. Uh, and uh, yeah, definitely we, we, we are coming out now from uh, a very um, hard moment. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, I was working on study abroad when, uh, when the pandemic started. And, and as you maybe know, study abroad means traveling, means mobility, means to bring people all around the world. And my mission was to bring people in Europe, in Italy, to understand our food system, to you know, reach the keys, to understand better the sustainability. Uh, processes and systems in their own country. So the study abroad uh, based on food and sustainability, it's really based on the fact that by traveling, you're able to uh, learn and know different cultures, but also you're able to know and learn different practices and different policies. And, and of course, uh, everything stopped uh, because of the pandemia. Um, I think uh, was for us, for all of us, uh, a moment to think about it. And first of all, to understand and maybe to reflect a little bit uh, on what was the purpose of this kind of education. And I think the pandemic gave us, uh, I mean, many problems, of course, but uh, as a designer, you know, I, I'm trying to look at the opportunities or better, I'm trying to look at the positive things. So what we can bring from a problem, what we can bring from a complexity. And, and I think I, we, we got the proof, at least, uh, the, fact, uh, the factual proof of the fact that we are all interconnected. So because there was this like big pandemia, all of us were concerning about health, were concerned about the, maybe climate change, were concerning about you know, the issue that everybody was facing, exactly like the pandemia. So for me, this was a kind of uh, um, a way of thinking of what we need to teach our students now. And what they really need now, do they need really to get my lecture and uh, you know, following the curricula I designed it in 2019 or do they need something else? And then I understood that they didn't need my previous curriculum. They needed the keys and the tools to, uh, to try to solve complexities. And I think because of the pandemia was one of the biggest complexity they found and maybe the biggest crisis all of us found in our in our personal life, I think the fact of giving them uh, the instruments for understanding and then 
defining those opportunities I mentioned before, and then defining the fact that we can, you know, solve and we can create, we can create new things because of the emergency, because of the situation, because of the fact that when we are in an emergency scenario, we found out the real values that we have to exalt. And because of this, because of this terrible moment we, 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 we had to face, on the other side, we did have a great opportunity to work as teacher, as professor, as educators, because we could bring this as a, as, as a real life approach and say, listening, now this is the scenario. We need to find out solution and we need this immediately. And there is another point when I was in a pandemia, I, I spent time with a friend of mine who is working in a war environment usually. So for her, the pandemic was just like one of the several emergency environments she had to face. And she told me, never design something during the emergency, but you have a lot of time to study because then you can design something for the after emergency. So I think this was for me really the point. You can get the time, you can get the time to reflect and you can see the people, how they are, in the, in the real world because of the emergency and because you see them in their daily life, in their family life, in their also professional life, you know, with smart working or all of this kind of thing. I think we were real people facing also many like little problems every day to, to you know, to fix our, our daily schedule. And I think this was the point. Try to understand exactly what is the scenario for then designing the after pandemia. And I think my students also appreciated the fact that by opening their fridge or like checking in their kitchen or studying their family approaches and behaviors, they could find interesting keys to be used for designing new things. You know, never, 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 I think they were designing so much by starting from ethnographic research in their family uh, activities or their family environment. So I think this was also a way to know each other better and to know what we do have as potential, uh, as potentialities that we can use it. So I think this is something I want to bring with you more than just like what we had to face, the difficulties on passing from, you know, uh, analogic life in academia through the uh, digital life. We all know what does it mean to you know, get your students on, 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 on a Zoom or on a team or on a whatever platform you use. But I really think for as an educator, we did have a great opportunity to rethink education. We need to rethink education and to help the people to understand why people nowadays need to be educated and how we can actually make them more responsible professionals and not just like, uh, you know, people with a degree. We need more responsible citizens, we need more responsible professionals, and the way how we can do it is to help them to face complexities and emergency, an emergent situation like we did have. So I don't know if I answered, but I no, think- No, you, you, definitely, you definitely answered it. And so uh, I guess the, there's a couple follow-up questions to that, or I wanna maybe go a little bit deeper. Majority of your classes or your courses were in-person, offline? Before the pandemia, all yeah. of those were offline. Yeah. And yeah, during the pandemic, all of them went online. The study abroad part, uh, uh, was it actually transformed in uh, virtual travel? So they did have the opportunity to travel all around Europe, but virtually. And for the other courses where I'm teaching at the university level, which are master program, I did have uh, the need of re redesigning the curriculum totally for making this possible because otherwise they couldn't go out and and you know interviewing people. They couldn't get any any contact with other people than their family and their uh, their classmates who were living with them. So uh, honestly, I had to redesign a little bit uh, the curricula and redesigning, of course, the project, uh, the team project that they had to work together in terms of design. That, that's that's so um, good to know and that, that that transition went well. There are some more learning lessons specifically for us because we focus a lot in on the basics, food, agriculture, food design, food systems. 
um, during the pandemic, that was the basics. That was the vital. The grocery stores were empty. People were worried about getting food. Uh, more food was wasted than ever before, but it was also an industry, entire industry that became more than an essential service and it continued to grow more investments made than any time ever more switches and efficiency and digital transitions um, to make sure that they would continue those services and new unique ways to continue to help. So there was, I guess, in some respects, kind of that microscope uh, that uh, lens was cast where the problems are, where what is working, what isn't working, what needs to be fixed, but also um, how essential it is that we get food systems right and we design them in the right way. And so I want to learn from you, were there some stark learning lessons? Were there some things that you definitely saw and aha moments? Um, was there also an and I don't know if opportunity is the right word, but a moment where you saw humanity is really understanding how important food systems are as the basis of all life. Whereas before, maybe that was more of a side thing left up to others to feed us instead of us to know a little bit more about how food systems work. Right. I think, you know, it was, it was a step-by-step -step learning, I think, because, uh, because of for many, many, um, many affiliation I do have, I think I was, uh, I was also learning myself on what it was going on. And for example, I didn't, I never realized it, for example, that um, closing the school uh, uh, could be like a big, uh, a big problem in terms of access to food. For I me, mean, for me, for me, it was quite clear that there were areas in the world in which the people did have access to food only because they, they went to school. They, they, they got the opportunity to go to school and to get the food right. Uh, but then, you know, I had two kids and I had to face myself the fact that they, they closed the school and everybody here was struggling about the fact that, uh, you know, kids were, were alone in their houses, but at least let me add that they were safe. But everybody was concerning about social distance, you know, and, and interaction. And in the meantime, because I was working with the with the Foundation Barilla on a, on a, on materials for education dedicated to right of food and access to food, I realized that how bigger it was the problem it was not just like the school closed, you know, it was really like many people, you know, facing poverty and hunger because of the school closed, and I think behind there are so many, let me say problems. I mean, you're right, you cannot use opportunity word, but uh, if this was a way of understanding, I think there was the opportunity also to get more people aware on what was the connection of food with many other uh, sectors. Uh, as we used to say, as you say as well, is food is transversal to all the 17 goals. And sometimes this is so abstract, sentence i mean it doesn't make sense right oh yeah i wrote an article about that i just read an article about that or i watch a, you know a presentation and it sounds great but what does it mean what does it mean and i think the pandemic was really giving us the opportunity to say concretely unfortunately listening getting education and quality education it's connected with food <laughs> and that's now we know why because if the people got education, they could get a meal. And this is something so, so, so big. And so, I mean, as a, as a mother, I think it's something that uh, was breaking my heart as well. Because on the, you got a paradox, you know, you had to bring your kids in a, in a healthy environment, so home, but then you're not giving them food to survive. And this is so paradoxically uh, um, unfair. Let me use the right word. But this is only one of the main examples we can bring to see how food was connected with all of the 17 goals during the pandemic. Uh, something that can be surprising as well, I just ended an article writing the fact that people were wasting less, in at least in a Western country. And, uh, and this was surprising, like people are wasting less during the pandemic. So what is going on? 
And something that it can be an interesting you know, discussion is why people are wasting less only because they understood the value of food, because they were stuck in their house and they were so afraid about the fact of not having enough food that they were not wasting. So if this is a sign, we just need to work on that because these are like a potentially interesting tool to be used to convince, which is not the right word, but to get people more aware and more, you know, concerned about the real value of food. So, yeah, again, there's some, there's really so many learning lessons that, that we have. And, and the biggest one is that it's not a siloed or linear approach. There's not just one facet, there's multiple complexities and, and really the food systems that are totally involved. I mean, you just spoke about one facet and that is how many, not just children's, but also college level and universities. And, and you have a nice section in the book. I can't remember if it's part three or part four, where they talk about, um, uh, university campus cafeterias and how those need to be redesigned around education and learning and, and how those interact um, is so true, but also how many students, no matter what age around the world, rely on a minimum of two meals a day coming from school cafeterias, school facilities, uh, somehow uh, as well as the, the feeding of their mind to get them out of ignorance or into another level of understanding on how our world truly works. And so you've touched on multiple things and, and, and just, just for our listeners, but also to go a little bit deeper, you know, your, your life, your work, your, your degrees are academic, but you write, have written numerous scientific publications, numerous uh, articles and journals, uh, contributions to numerous books. I mean, I'll put the link to your website in the show note descriptions and people can see part of that's being a doctor and writing a PhD as well, because it's about publications. It's about getting the awareness out. But the other part is, is you're really trying to shift the paradigm of how teaching and learning and understanding of systems and these innovations and technology, the whole big picture fits all together. And I want to give kind of an example because the, the clear focus that we've addressed on now is, is really in the academic and the learning aspect of it. We've known during the pandemic, uh, August 21st, 2020, one of the biggest, greatest educators of our time, uh, Sir Ken Robinson passed away, uh, which was a big loss. And he was really kind of pushing to change our, the way we educate, the way we teach, the way we do it in a different way that's uh, more uh, receptive to, to the learner. And there's an example who someone who is a great designer, no longer with us, or was a great de designer, our Buckminster Fuller and the Buckminster Fuller Institute. One of his famous sayings, or a couple of his famous sayings, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, one of them is, I have spent most of my life unlearning things that were proven not to be true. So somehow in our teaching and our learnings, we've learned some things or didn't get to learn things that were just fundamentally incorrect. And then we have to spend a part of our life unlearning those things. And I think what one of the, not opportunities, but during the pandemic, we've seen some of the problems, but also some of the systems that we've created that are just not working well for humanity. And one is, is the, the, the food at school and our education, higher learning systems, period. The, the other one is, is you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, you have to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So those are two fabulous things from Buckminster Fuller. And he really wrote the the operating manual for spaceship earth, you know, and in that in on the inside cover of that book, he had, he gave us his why and his why 
was to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or disadvantage of anyone. That was written in the 1960s. And he's, he's a designer, an architect, a designer for life. And he's given us a why that is good for us all. And I see that same thing in all of your works, all your scientific writings in this book, in the case studies that you give us, you're trying to give us new models that are current relative to what we're experiencing in our life to get this paradigm shift for how, how we realize that our most vital resource is food. And if we don't design it right, if we don't understand how it ties to us, then we're, we're really stuffed. And so I've kind of, hopefully I've set up for you to respond to that nicely and that, that people can now get the bigger picture why do we need to educate around food? Why are we, you know, why, why is this? But I, I don't know if you have something to say about that and the, the vitalness of, of what your work is and, and not only design, but academic as well. You, you pointed out the right things, the fact that uh, we need concreteness and not any more abstract concept. Uh, I'm coming from the communication studies. My first degree was in communication studies, and I always understood the fact that you need to communicate real things. When you do advertising, sometimes uh, you are concerning on the fact that you are selling, and selling sometimes means uh, that you have to re um, redesign the brand, redesign the identity, redesign. But then something that always you cannot redesign are the values. The values are, can be only exalted. So the human values. Recently, I've been thinking so much about human values because as you maybe know, for the one who are familiar with the design, we pass through many steps of design, right? We pass from user center and then experience center. It depends really like the design is uh, is defining what is going on in the society. So the design changed because the society changed. And I believe in the past 10 years, we were all of us uh, really agree on the fact that uh, we needed human value centered design. So we needed a design based on real human values. Recently, I've been thinking about that exactly on what you were pointed out before. And I realized that you know education as experiential education and design as a potential method that you can use in education to help students you know, to solve and to make new things, need maybe a new age and not any more human value center design approach, but maybe an agency center, uh, center design, which means that is not enough to identify the values and excel those values. You have to give the people the opportunity to become agent of change. And that means that they need to be able to use those values for then making something that will change the current system. Otherwise, we will continue to get through the actual system. Maybe we will do it, uh, uh, what we call it, the proactive design. We will change something, we will do something around, or we will adjust it, or we will make it something better. Uh, we will add one function, but this is not exactly what we need. We need emergent design. We need something that really bring new things in because that's another interesting uh, teaching uh, model that my, my professor when I was at the university gave to me and they bring this to every speech I'm doing, which is when you think something is very complex and it's impossible to solve it, look at the nature because it's already solved it because the nature is the most complex area. And I mean, nature means really the planet and the, what is behind that. It's already the most complex systems ever, but the solution are already there. So as a designer, I believe really the concreteness and to go through the what, I mean, the real life behind us is exactly what we have to do it. And so this takes time, takes a lot, of also training for the educators because the educators are not ready for that. Uh, my book as well was actually in a way designed for bringing, I mean, the book is coming in a, for example, I'm sorry for jumping on this, but I think this is really uh, connected with, this is a book that comes from a series for marketing and strategic marketing, okay? And as you know, 
marketing and design don't speak the same language. So for me, this was a challenge. I really wanted to bring design in marketing, but not as the tool that helped marketing to do what it does, but instead to show that the potentiality of the two approaches together can really do, can really make the change. And this is why the book is bringing you know, experts from different fields to present the design as an approach, as a method, as a way of thinking. And the marketing, which is practically based on the fact that had to sell something, can add to this kind of principles, other principles based on the human values, based on the agency center design, based on the transdisciplinarity, which is one key word, again, very abstract word, but what does it mean this in concreteness? And what does it mean this in concrete? in real life, every day, how we do transdisciplinary approach. What does it mean that? And every time we do multidisciplinary things, but never transdisciplinary things. As a designer, we only work in transdisciplinary way. So this is something we want to bring and give as a gift to all the other disciplines, definitely. Oh, I absolutely love that. And I'm glad that you brought that up because that's exactly where I want to go. So the the book is so wonderfully written I, and i i i think it's beyond an academic level but it's at a level for everyone to read and it's one as a tool it's not one where you'd say boy this is a boring academic read with a, a um hard to read and difficult to get through it uh, and i I don't know if you would think it's a workbook, but it is very easy to read. It's very interesting to read and it's multifaceted and it's diverse. You have a plethora. I don't know the exact count of contributors you have, but it's a numerous and numerous case studies throughout. Um, the, the first one I really want to touch upon is uh, Professor Franco Fascio. Absolutely love that section. I loved all the sections, but I loved his his section from the uh, University of Gastronomic Sciences, Palenzo campus, Piazza. Um, uh, you know, he's an assistant professor of industrial design, but doing amazing, crazy, cool stuff around food and providing us with different tools to use different lenses to understand and be empowered around that. So I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about him and, and uh, wasn't he also to, involved in the systemic food design or is that another, yeah, he was. The website that is providing as an case studies is exactly this uh, systemic food design uh, dot it. And it was, uh, as you mentioned, he is a professor at the Gastronomic Science in Polento, which is maybe, you know, as a slow food university. And uh, definitely this uh, contribution is in the first section of the book, which is also another interesting point. I want to uh, underline the fact that book brings the entire supply chain, production, distribution, commercialization, and post-consumption, instead of just like focusing only on, so on consumption, right? And, and usually this is like the misconception, misunderstanding about design. Design is just the, what you eat, what is aesthetically good, and what make you happy. Uh, no, design is what the kind of approach and the kind of knowledge and competences and expertise you need to redesign and you know to see from the complexity potential solution. He actually presented this uh, website as an interactive tool that can be also connector between who is producing and who is eating in terms of knowledge and information and also awareness on what is the real chain in. And this website was really working well. He this article, for example, is an update on the first article, which was in another book, to give us an update on how the website was working, how it was actually used, and how the farmers get uh, you know, also, um, in a way, uh, good impacts because of the use of this. Uh, then um, Franco is actually uh, a colleague of mine who is also working with me at the commission of the ADI food design coordination where we select the good uh, 
uh, or at least the best uh, food design uh, um, service systems, objectives, products uh, every year. And we all of us as this as an idea that uh, it is not the real food design or interesting food design if it doesn't really include the emergent food action and behavior. So definitely this is exactly what we need to create, new cultures. To get new cultures, you need to work cognitively with people and awareness is not enough. You have to make them, you know, in a in a in a environment, in a scenario in which they can use their knowledge in and, and then to, translating and transforming this in concrete action and, and, and behaviors. So. I absolutely love that section. There's a plethora of links throughout the book um, that you can go to. Not only, uh, obviously, the footnotes and the references are all there of where this content comes from, but there are, is a mind map, of, a, a roadmap of different links of where you can go for real world tools, people who are working on this, thinking on this. So I love that about your book. But, but I want the reason I tease that first is because now I want to take actually a step back to what you already discussed and you, you know, it, this isn't the tr uh, traditional or what you would expect about marketing and, and how marketing works, especially around food, which we kind of know the, the, uh, the good, bad, and the ugly on how, on how that looks and how it has been done in the past and, and what a big movement and in industry that is. I, I want to go more into your insights, but also uh, you, you overtly don't address this directly in the book, but I think through the way you present it and the way you do it, you, you, I think you're giving us some opinions and the others who are in the book are giving us opinions as well. Do we need people to market food to us? Do we need people? Do we need agencies and, and lobbyists to market apples and oranges to us and milk and, and yogurts? Do we need that? Is that, is, that, is that something that's vital or would it be more the taste, the health benefits, the environmental benefits or the true cost accounting that would be better to market to us, whether it's destroying our health and our planet or uh, I, I mean, and maybe I'm in a bubble and I probably am in a bubble with the people I surround myself around sustainability and food, but I haven't watched TV in a commercial or marketing around what beer to drink or what wine to drink or what food to eat or what apple to buy or meat to buy, whatever it is, I just haven't seen that in decades, probably, unless I've been at the airport or somewhere trapped and I've just seen it by happenstance. And if I have, I guarantee I've never went out hunting for that brand to have it because I need to eat it. So is that just me or is that something that's necessary? And why don't we use that budget, that money's for something more important down the road? Or is, or is that not a topic that you cover or do you cover it in a different way? I, we, because it is a design book, it doesn't cover this so much, but I can answer and I can give you also my perspective that maybe it can come out from the many contributors of this book on the fact that nowadays, uh, I still believe the sustainability is not a value for the people. As I mentioned before, the role of the design is to exalt human values. So I would say that during the pandemic, the uh, human values of family or friendship or like also um, the, 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 the connection between people, uh, the fact of because we did have social distance, we realized how important it is to be with people and stay with people. So let me use the word love that maybe is very is very naive but uh, many of those values came out to us as like oh this those are really the values i really want to preserve for all my life I, i'm concerning to the fact that maybe the word sustainability didn't really come out as one of the values you want to bring so from one side you got the marketing which is producing an an, an evolving commercial values which are not human values we need just to identify the two paths. One is commercial value, one is the human values. 
and they don't actually follow the same the same direction. Design really works on human values, not on commercial values. I mean, the commercial values comes when you have a brief and you have to make a new product. But then there is another keyword that maybe it's super abstract, which is the ethics. So as a food designer, as a designer, do I need to follow some ethics, ethical purpose in which I'm going to design and produce only you know, something that is sustainable, it's a healthy, it's sustainable, it's good for me, it's good for the planet. Let's do that. But again, sustainability, it's not nowadays so strong for uh, driving, for driving, let me use this, for driving both design and marketing. So what we need to do is to educate people to create the culture of sustainability because the culture of sustainability can be created only if we are able to make these values important for the people. So for me, for example, what was really interesting um, was uh, a dialogue I did have during the pandemic, was going to back to the pandemic with marketing company, they invited me as a designer to talk about uh, the many issues that happened through the e-commerce you know, e-commerce was so important during the pandemic, more than more than before. And of course, the marketing needed to sell more. And, and the purpose was like, how we can sell more? You're saying investing money. I, I'm saying, look at the cost of this regeneration to have it and how much cost we, we, we need to cover, right? And, and I realized that one of the, maybe you don't know, but one of the uh, sector that was very impacted by the pandemia was the, the seafood, the fishes, because people didn't buy so much seafood through the commerce. And so the purpose was like how we can sell it. And I studied the seafood and I studied the fishes and I understood that uh, we don't know anything about seafood and, <laughs> and fishes. As humans, as customers, as a citizen, we have no idea what does it mean farming the fishes. We have no idea what does it mean freshness. We don't recognize a fresh fish from a no fresh fish. Or we had, I mean, I realized that the ignorance about this kind of product was so much. And then what I said during the dialogue was exactly this. Before starting marketing, you just need to understand how much people know and how you can bring them in a sustainable perspective of, uh, of, of eating seafood. Like uh, if, if there are a seasonable way of seeing seafood, yes, there is. How many of us knows the seasonability or the seasons of, uh, of fishes? So there is so much space to work with. And uh, I think market, there is space for marketing as well. So I don't really uh, believe we need to cut it. And this is the purpose of the book as well. It's like, look, what you see is only the little part of. We, there is a, lit, a big world around in which you can design, you can uh, create new markets as well. Because market, if it is sustainable, why not? If there are new products that are sustainable and good for us and the planet, why not? Let's do it. The issue is when you design unsustainable systems, you design unsustainable products and you preserve unsustainable environment. This is the problem. But then if we all work for a purpose, this would be perfect. And doesn't matter if you are a designer, marketing, an advertiser or, or whatever. The important thing is that we do have a direction to follow. And I think this is really important. This is why we have to train the new professionals. Because unfortunately, we are still trained, and I'm sorry, now I'm polemic in that when I'm saying that, but we are no, still trained. Fine. We are still training in business manager, doing and thinking exactly like 50 years ago. So how we can think to change the system if you train the students in economics, if you train the students in marketing exactly like 50 years ago. You cannot modify the system. You have to re- uh, shape their brain in a way that you have to educate them and train them to see out of the box also, and not only in one direction. And I think this is really the purpose now. My, my course on sustainability design thinking, it is in an economic department. And, 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 and it is because it's a challenge. 
I got students already in a master level. And those students were already trained to become manager, to become, you know, producer, to become entrepreneurs, to become a marketing manager, so seller. And I'm coming with my course, like shaping their brain or shaping their views and see, hey, there is another word there, look at. And, and this is not correct. They, they just got me when they are 24 years old. They need to get, you know, step by step, this process of learning, starting when they're kids, when they're five, they're, when they're 10, when they're 13, and go on. And when they will be professional, it will be, they will be sustainable natives, exactly like they are the digital natives nowadays. They are people who are born in a world where getting digital devices doesn't really need effort. And this is exactly what we need for sustainable natives, people that are growing in a world where all the tools, devices, services, and systems are sustainable, and they got the competences and the knowledge for using those without any effort. Because we don't need to forget this importance of getting knowledge and competences. Otherwise, also if the world will change and we will not change our perspective and way of thinking, our competences, nothing will change. We need to work together in this, in this process. I, lo I love your courses and I love that you do it in that way. And, and for my listeners, some, some of them will know, but some of them don't. And, and I know you do very well. Some might question, well, how are you teaching this uh, sustainable food design and, and, and what you're teaching uh, in an economics umbrella in, in an academic setting? Well, the key fact is the, the world's oldest, well-functioning and longest running successful economy is an agrarian society, which is tied to food. The food is the, not only the biggest impact on sustainability, nature, environment, human health and suffering, but it's also the biggest economy that our world's ever seen. And it's still existing and thriving even in a pandemic. Uh, continually grew up because it's an essential function of life. And um, that's one reason why you so nicely fit in, in economics. But out of all the models of ec economic models that are out there in the world, um, be sustainable or to think in that direction at a, at a college, university level, uh, uh, doctorate level, you really need to understand economics, the bad economics, the, the bubbles, the issues with economics, but more so, you also need to understand what economic models work. And the only one that really truly works is ecological economics and will get us well into the future. And, and so those people who are, who are really well-versed and not greenwashing or kind of just saying for a fact, should be pretty well versed in economics. And what are the economic models that will take, take us into sustainable, resilient, desirable futures through multiple generations, seven, 10, 20 generations into the future, where we can be within the safe operating spaces of planetary boundaries, and we can address those social and economic needs of our world uh, through the lens of food and through the lens of more environmental social governance, which has a big part in food and basics, essential services. And so I love that you do that. And I, I, I speak about economics and, and, and tie it to, to food and, and how we should look at our economic models. One big model that, that I'd like to address and then we'll go more into to food systems design and the systems uh, discussed in, in your book it is really the simple fact that um, this, this whole thing is, is super complex. And, and the reason we need to talk about it in a different way is it's, it's the, the basics of our life. And, and um, it is a model for us to get into different learnings and abilities to get us into future generations for sustainability, but it involves innovation. And you talked about wa food waste and you talked about how things are working. 
we're really in this industry of agriculture, food, beverages, industry, seafood industries, we're still stuck in the industrial revolution. We're about 200 years behind on advanced processes, sustainability, efficiency, digitization, the way we pay our employees, migrant workers and things. And during the pandemic, we saw, even though on home usage that the waste went down, we saw an uptick worldwide that the food waste went up to 40% food waste and in some areas even higher during this pandemic because there weren't enough workers to harvest and process the food. So it was being tilled back under in the agricultural sector. And also the closing of gastronomy and food processing facilities um, because they didn't have enough employees and the social distancing and those things in place in the infrastructure of those food systems to be able to, to keep business as usual or to keep the doors open during that time of a pandemic because they're not up to speed with where our world needs to be in this area. And food design and that systemic principles that you speak about in, in your book in a few sections, uh, MIT has a, a section in the book. Many are talking about systems thinking, systems designed. Um, the entire world, international organizations, World Trade Organization, WHO, UN, FAO, um, World Economic Forum, 2018, all of them went from a linear siloed approach to solving grand challenges to a systemic systems design dynamic modeling to solve our problems. And in your book, you have links, you refer to Fritz of Capra, you refer to a symbiotic earth, you refer to um, MIT and many others, the Meadows Report and the limits to growth and different things where we think about systems. I want you to tell us about in your book, why this is such a vital point and how you're helping people embrace this complexity and this thing that we get scared about to make this transition, to put on a different lens, to see systems and how they work in our lives. Well, first of all, because uh, as I mentioned before, I really believe uh, the two keywords of the new age of this next 10 years, it will be transdisciplinarity and empathy. And, uh, and I don't think uh, those are the skills and the competences that were never, never, never included in any curricula uh, in which me, you, or you know, our generation were, 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 were trained, uh, whatever it was, high school or university or, or, or primary school. I think because of this, of this gap and lack, uh, I, I, I believe we are now in the situation we are because we were not trained to use our empathy uh, dynamics or empathy competencies, which I believe is like paramount for the creation of a sustainable uh, perspective, a global pers um, sustainable perspective, but also a local because uh, many of us are completely disconnected with the community where we live. And so activating empathy with the community where you live, it is already like a big, a big, a big change that you can create, you know. Uh, on the other side, transdisciplinarity, and that's also one of the key words I use in the, uh, was suggested by the editor, of course, but uh, I decided to include it in the, in the title of the book is the fact that uh, for many times and for many years, uh, we were just like focusing on interdisciplinarity, which is something different. Interdisciplinarity, there is also always someone that win, because if you put together people with different expertise or different sector, Let's, I, I, I put this example in the, in the book, which I think is simple. You know, you got a doctor, a farmer, a policymaker, and a designer. You put them in a room without saying anything, they will be in silence. And that's a multicultural room. There is no, uh, sorry, a multidisciplinary, a multicultural room. Okay. It's interesting, but nobody was doing anything. Then interdisciplinary, it's when you ask them and you give them a question to, or a problem to solve. And you ask them, okay, can you please talk about it? Can you just discuss it? And then the farmer, the designer, the policymaker, or the nutritionist will start talking. We are sure that there will be a leader in the discussion. We are sure there will be someone that will not have enough space to speak. And there will be interaction, interdisciplinarity for sure. 
but the priority of someone could be that become stronger than other priorities. So this is exactly the system in which we are living. The transdisciplinarity is different, is when you take the lens, the investigation lens of someone that does have a different background than yours, you understand the problem by using their own, their lens, so their, their, their view, their, their perspective, but then you give the lens back and you continue with your own expertise. If we all of us do the same process together, we will have a win-win situation where everybody will get the priority satisfied everybody will be happy with the solution. There will be not someone getting you know, more power than others. The transdisciplinarity, it's a very, very strong process to be, uh, to be used. And sometimes you know, we started in the school to teach by team project, by challenge-based learning. There are also like specific academic and didactic um, model of teaching that helps to become more aware and more um, able to use transdisciplinarity, but maybe it's not enough. We just need to get this kind of process more actively used in, uh, in, in the professional life as well, because only in this way we will have solutions that are fine for farmers and fine for policy makers. We'll be fine for marketing manager, but we'll be fine for customers as well. So in this way, we will be able to get a kind of balances and in this way, I believe design can help and can be an interesting tool that not everybody understands what it is. And, um, and I, I want to just to point it out, if I can, that from the book, the idea of creating a no-profit no organization with other co-founder came out quite easily because we decided that this is the time in which we have to tell people in gastronomy, producer, policymakers, that design, it's it's a, it's a superpower. So it's, a, it's something that you need to use it because not because it's just like how to make it, but instead it's giving you the why you make it. You mentioned this at the beginning, the why is more important than the how. So the why you make it, it's the transdisciplinarity approach. Understanding and then designing something that is win-win for everybody and make this systemic approach the way how we have to work nowadays. There's no other way to say. We were too much linear in the past. Now we need to be more systemic in what we do. So the, the, the organization we created is called Fork, and the name is giving us already like the idea of what we want to do because Fork means for food design, opportunities, research, and knowledge. And this is exactly what we want to give to people in the, every sector related with food, but not only food. This kind of knowledge, this kind of understanding, this kind of uh, also, uh, I would like to say, um, view of the fact that the things can be done differently, which I think is important. Yeah, and I, I, I definitely wanted to, I'm glad that you brought that up because that new venture, and I'm glad that it came up through, through the book, but, you know, FORC really, as you said, it stands for food design, opportunities, research, knowledge, um, came, came up through Barcelona Design Week, am I correct? We launched during the Barcelona Design Week. In reality, we are five co-founders. Uh, three of them are based in, in Spain, one is based on, in, um, in Lisbon, so in Portugal, and that myself in, uh, in, uh, in Italy, and uh, I'm happy to share with you the link of the organization with the name of all the co-founder, uh, that with me uh, are in a way um, accepting the challenge. We really want to, for example, I mean, what, something we didn't mention today, but because there is no really an article on this in the book, which I think it maybe is a gap and something we can <laughs> doing in the next book, uh, it's gastronomy. There is a one side dedicated to the food experience. So we talk about robotic, we, do, we talk about digital approach in the, in, the, in the food production and food consumption. But then how we're going to train the chef and the cooks of the, of the present and the future to make their product, their culinary art product, more sustainable and healthier for us and for the planet. So 
how design can help in this, how design can be a tool for educating, can be a tool for transmitting knowledge uh, in this term. So uh, with Mariana Edler, uh, who is actually a designer, with uh, Antonio Barrera, with uh, uh, Pedro and uh, Alvarez and uh, Ricardo Bonaccio, we really have this as a mission to provide something that can be helpful to food, but also to provide to the design field the opportunity of working in food in a more sustainable way. You're, you're really um, key for the Future Food Institute and around the academic uh, around. So there's Future Food Institute and then there's a Future Food Academy and you're really responsible for creating, designing the curriculum and making sure it's driving and going in the right direction. And I, I'm, I'm glad because it's, it's been an institute that's worldwide had a presence, very diverse. They're trying to take everything from the entire world to look at cultures. What does food look like? What's the different lens in this transdisciplinary? What you exactly say is how can we get to show those students the lens of others but also then give them the experience to create and design something that will be regenerative and long lasting. That's very sustainable there. Uh, I, I think we've teased your book enough. Um, I, I want to ask you for one last little, maybe the, the uh, takeaway that you want us to have the most out of your book, because I don't want to give it all away. I want people to go out and buy it. I want them to, to use it, to find it as a plethora of resources, not just because I wrote the prologue. No, I'm just teasing. But, but really, because it is a workbook, it's a plethora of knowledge, and it's anyone um, uh, who's in this area, anybody who wants to know a full picture of what the food systems look like and and how you can contribute, how you can be a consumer or someone who plays an active part. This is really um, the plethora of case studies and people who are actually doing this at the moment on the ground and setting in the pathways. And I'm glad that you said, yeah, maybe there's a gap or we left this out in gastronomy or there's things. But overall, it's the most well-rounded work that I've seen in a long time. And I read, I, I read four to five food books a week and other books. And so I, I think I have my ear to the ground uh, for, for many respects. So I'm very thankful for that. But what would you say is the, the biggest takeaway that you want people to have out of the book and sections that you would like to make them aware of and, and your overall insight? Thank, thank you, Mark, also for mentioning the Future Food Institute, where I, I that I joined actually in uh, in uh, in the last fall, and uh, and is giving me. I'm not the one creating, but I got the honor of joining the, the the Future Food Institute and in the many activities they are they are doing. And I believe this is giving me the the bridge for my uh, takeaway, and uh, because I believe uh, uh, that we need to believe that not only the youth, but uh, everybody can do something for this, uh, this situation. So uh, at the Future Food Institute, as you, as you know, they are training the future food and climate shapers uh, by knowing also that uh, the youth and the young people are very active for the change. But it's also true that not many young people, as well many adults, know the connection between food and climate change, as well the connection with food with many other sectors. So my takeaway is really this, to take the responsibility to be informed, to take the responsibility as educator to, uh, to transfer the right knowledge and competences to our students. This book, I, I hope, will be one day the book a professor will choose to help their students to think differently, to get through the food field and say, oh, food is this also, or food can be uh, read in a different way, or oh, those are the connection between food and other sectors. I really want this book become a little part maybe of an impact. So I hope this book will create like an impact that uh, will be 
able to change the world that we live nowadays. It, it definitely will. And, and it, you need to design for it. Otherwise, it will never happen. And so that's why I know for a fact, this is a vital book that and the, the, there's, there's not that many out there with such uh, timely information and projects and case studies that have been done and going on some very uh, enlightening wisdoms in, in this book. I have four last, uh, five, actually five, I lied. Thanks all the contributors, because this is not uh, uh, my own book, but is an edited book. I just want to underline this. So as you mentioned before, there are like uh, almost 18 contributors uh, who were uh, so kind and, uh, and patient also, because we did this during the pandemic. So the time was not uh, easy also for... <laughs> for being connected together uh, but I think also because of the pandemia we were uh, really really uh, strong on making this possible and I'm happy this book uh, was able to come out uh, now when uh, I would like to say we see the future coming out uh, I want to be positive I, I hope uh, this will be like the time of regenerating but also the time to rethinking uh, and uh, and so I, I really really thanks all the contributors and all the authors that are uh, with me in this adventure, this uh, book adventure. Yeah, I, I thank them as well because it's fabulous and it just shows how um, good of an editor and how good of a designer you are to pull together such fabulous people to, 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 to come up with this work. I have five questions left for you. Um, two are pretty hard still. Um, and then the last three are kind of easy. So I'm going to let you slide off in the end. The first one is, do you feel like you're a global citizen? And how would you feel about a world with the removal of nations and borders and divisions of humanity one from another? And the reason I ask you this is not only because of the transdisciplinary aspect of your work, but also the global aspect of your work. The pandemic was a global citizen. Food is a global citizen. Air, water is a global citizen. Species are, and definitely the pandemic was. And so I, I really want to get your views and feelings and how this ties into your work and also into your edu educating. I really believe uh, that, uh, yeah, there is a global world, but uh, you can start and you have to start from the local perspective by actively working with your own community and uh, with, uh, you know, little butterfly effect that can produce uh, <laughs> enormous impact. So I strongly believe on working with your community. Sometimes, you know, we are so focused on, Oh, now what I can do it, and instead you can just need to teach the people around you that the forestation is connected with the food you eat every single day. So just start from little things, you know. You choose one food instead of another, you are making an impact that is globalized. So let's start educating people in this way. I love that. I really do love that. And there's this big movement has been for last um, ten years to. And it's really picking up steam, local futures, local economies. It doesn't mean that we're not global citizens. doesn't mean we're not all crew members on the spaceship Earth. But it means that we can have strength when we fix our local communities, our local food webs, a lot better than we can um, on this bigger perspective. And even in, in, in the book, you talk about global so there's some difference of local and global, and then this um, mixed terminology, global. The next question is the last hardest question I have for you, and it is the burning question, WTF. And many people have been saying this, uh, thinking it's the swear word during this pandemic and these crazy times, but it's not the swear word. It's what's the future, and it's really more so what's the future is the plural. And I really want to know specifically for you, what's the roadmap? What's the future for you? And what do you think is the biggest uh, way for us moving forward? 
That's a big question. I'm not sure I do have a big answer for this question. I think I, I, I do have my own answer, which is uh, for me, the future will be to intensify the education. Intensified education means really to get all the resources I do have for um, convincing from all level of education. So I'm talking about teachers, but I'm talking about also minister that are in charge of, you know, including food education, for example, in school. I'm actually really, really, I want to be positive. I'm really pushing to get this kind of knowledge uh, coming out uh, and becoming part of the, uh, you know, background everybody will have. So for me, the future will be will be this: people more informed, a better demand. So the demand that is educated, and, and of course, uh, for doing this, we need to work to a lot, all of us, and to bring also our good practices to people that maybe before we're not taking care of this. Uh, again, we go back to the beginning of this uh, of this dialogue. Uh, uh, the pandemic gave us the opportunity to rethink. Because we think we need to reboot, and because of rebooting, we need to, you know, to see how we can also bring other people in this kind of uh, process and of change. So that means convincing other people doing that. I, I really want to see a good future. Um, I think we are so scared now that we are able to be convinced soon <laughs> on uh, a different that a different world is possible. So education is the first step for sure. I absolutely love that. And that's uh, so important. I want to kind of ask you before I get into the last three questions, um, uh, which are mainly takeaways for my listeners. I want to ask you, there's been some really interesting things happening since 2015, but also since 2020. Now the United Nations and the World Economic Forum have really stepped up to the plate with the UN Food Systems Summit more food events and and you're in italy so the fao is in rome and there's a lot of things going around food and, and agriculture in that respect but w- what is your participatory level how are you participating in all this and what is your lens and your view of how are we going in the right direction is this positive and, and um is it truly this opportunity for us all to have a voice at the table the big kitchen of the world well, uh, you mentioned the, the Food Systems Summit. Uh, I can mention many other big move, movement, or I would like to say processes that were already activated, like the Green Deal, the Farm to Fork, and the, I mean, it, now, right now the G20, and the fact that Italy is the president of the G20 this year is getting like uh, the, perfect, the perfect environment for bringing the attention to food and climate change. So this is the point. Uh, why don't we put together all of those and we use the knowledge? I mean, the Food System Summit can actually, uh, it's based on food, of course, but then bringing food, bringing the climate change, bringing those kind of topics to the G20 has to be a priority. So let's see if this uh, combination of big event and combination of big people, let's call it that, uh, but in a way it can be also a good connection of the dots because this has to be the, the, the purpose, right? So bring the, the knowledge from the Food System Summit to the G20, for example, or bringing what we have it from the Green Deal and the European po- po- policies back to the discussion or I want to keep in this kind of loop of thinking also the new European Bauhaus that was launched recently in terms of getting creativity on the way how we do things. And so for me, this is the perfect ending. Why don't we use creativity to make it something new? So connecting all of those big events and big uh, purposes, I think is always the best. And not maintaining them disconnected and getting them as, as just like, you know, single spots that works uh, independently. I love that. And and thanks for sharing that view with us. And uh, the last three questions are for my listeners. If you had one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? And that's okay if it's even two messages. 
everybody it's creative and be creative is like uh it's like for you going to the gym you know you want a good body you go to the gym and you do practices same happen for creativity so we just need to practice and the best environment to do it is food and sustainability so being creative there really works uh so we just need to do practices and one or two what do you want <laughs> i do yeah, have more than no definitely and uh, i think also the fact of uh, um the word sustainability as i told you before it's very it's very abstract sometimes i don't like it and i think is also over overuse it so it's something that uh, maybe we just need to change it sometimes uh, but then i bring this word to your real life and think about it what is sustainable for you and think about you during the pandemia think about you during the lockdown and, and, and really answer to this question, what was sustainable for you? And you will get the answer on what does it mean sustainability? Just make it this uh, uh, like a kind of uh, mantra or something like uh, your vision in, it will help you all the time to see what is the right direction to follow. What should young innovators, young designers, young academics, or professors in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a real impact? Well, um, I would like to say to make a real impact, they have to work collaboratively. So first of all, not to think that they can do it alone, they can do individually, but they, they just need to bring other people in. And, uh, and this is important specifically also for my, my, my future women professional, future women designer and women, I'm sorry to bring the gender issue in, but I think also the women need uh, an extra help and support uh, for understanding that uh, it is not only to be part of what we can do it, but is also to make new things uh, themselves. So uh, definitely uh, let's support them and give them the opportunity to, uh, to envision a different future as well. I love that. And the last question is, have, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Mm. That's become, it's becoming more and more difficult, those questions. Um, I think, um, connect, you know, I always thought and academically also this uh, seems to be a limit that uh, working in many sectors and with many organizations, with many uh, different people with different background was a problem or at least was a limitation because uh, sometimes also academically people are asking you, for example, publishing on searching in one only topic, right? On one only sector to become uh, an academic. Um, I believe now I'm more than 40, I'm 44. I think this was my superpower. <laughs> and I think uh, um, I was in a way trying to define this with words. And I remember starting to say, I'm uh, like uh, always uh, no satisfaction. I never had satisfaction by being pioneering, which is sounds good, but is always bad. Like I'm a really, uh, how we say, like an uh, unsatisfied uh, pioneer, no? someone that really wants to do something new all the time. And I say, this is really sounds so negative. And then I decided to say that I'm an insatiable visionary, so something that needs to be always visionary in. And I think this is possible, posi positive. So definitely I learned this and I hope to be able to continue doing that. And uh, there's no other way for me to work with. So I, I need to go in many, I'm like a sponge. And I don't think this is a limitation. It is something that is giving me the opportunity to explore in many, many sectors. And I think this is important. In food, it's paramount. <laughs> so there is no other way to, to work in. Sonia, thank you so much for letting us inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. We could talk for hours about all the 
things you've done and you're planning to do. Unless uh, I'm done with my questions, unless you've uh, forgotten to tell us something or left something out, this will be your chance to, to tell us. But otherwise, I really thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this invitation and all for this question that were super difficult at the end. So. No, no problem. I, uh, again, it it's, was a real honor to review your book and to be part of the pro, prologue transdisciplinary case studies on design for food and sustainability. I'm going to put all the, the notes and the show description and the links. I want people to go out there and get it. It's a wonderful work. And I thank you very much. I appreciate it, Sonia. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.